I'm uh, David Kendall. Kendall. I'm the chair of the Missoula County Democrats. Two We're different. here for a great program and uh, um, here on an important night for our primary uh, election process as well. Um, so we'll see how that turns out in terms of the actual numbers later on. Uh, but let me uh, get us going by introducing um, Todd Mowbray, who with uh, Roberta Crane have put together this excellent program today. Todd will be the model. Thanks for coming, you guys, and especially thank you to these three, Galena, Dustin, and Shane. Uh, I'm going to let them each, when they speak, they're going to speak in order, uh, each one uh, involved with areas of their own expertise, and I'll let them introduce themselves, because they can be very proud of their accomplishments and the degree to which they utterly smash the racial stereotypes that some of our legislators and agriculture interests have put forth. Um, so, uh, Shane, Dustin, uh, Molina, and then afterwards we will have written questions and uh, you can either address those to the group or to an individual presenter and I'll read the questions and, and direct them and uh, we'll give them each a, oh, we, Dave, we have a big business meeting after this as well, so Dave would like to wrap this up right about 8 o'clock. So um, I'll kind of keep an eye on the clock and, and move things along as needed. So uh, Shane, why don't you go first? Okay. Are you having us all introduce first? Yeah. Well, well, first? Uh, give your own uh, resume. Okay. okay. Uh, I mean, I could do it, but you, yeah. you should say so. Um, so my name's Shane Morjo, and uh, I had to change out the chairs because I'm not tall enough to sit in these uh, chairs here. These desks are a little bit taller than um, expected. Uh, um, I'm a member of the Salish and Kootenai tribes, and uh, I work as general counsel, in-house counsel for the tribes. And uh, I've been working for the tribes for about uh, five years now, and uh, during that time I I went over to the legislature and worked for the tribes as a lobbyist on varying issues with many of the um, representatives and senators here tonight. And uh, we've accomplished, accomplished a lot over the last two sessions. And uh, um, I think we have a lot of work to do still in, in Montana. But uh, tonight, I'm here to, um, I will uh, uh, caveat or uh, confess that I am running for uh, House District 95. Uh, but um, as far as my presentation tonight, it's strictly here to um, try and inform individuals a little more on Indian issues and my experiences in the legislature and some of the things that I've, I've worked on and seen over the last um, five years um, in the last two sessions. So, you know, to just kind of dive into things uh, to start out, I think it's pretty important for people to have a good understanding of uh, history and policy and although I'd really like to go into depth on history and policy um, in Indian country and how that kind of all transpired I'm going to give a very quick overview of, of the policies and cases that kind of shaped um, Indian law and Indian country and the policies that tribes have kind of built uh, infrastructure around in our, in our government so um, I'm gonna just dive into it and you know basically start with you know the United States Constitution uh, was ratified in 1788 and part of the Constitution is the, that Congress regulate commerce with Indian tribes and so that's an important thing to keep in mind as to what Congress's relationship and how that comes into play with tribes uh, moving along from there there was three landmark cases called the Marshall trilogies um, from 1820 to 1850 and the the first case was Johnson v McIntosh which basically uh, set out the doctrine of discovery. It said, uh, you know, basically, tribes, you guys have the right to acquire, or you guys have the right to occupy, but anyone else who comes to, to acquire land, the, the federal government basically has title good against all others because they were the, the basically the discoverer, the conqueror. Um, and then from there, we saw the next landmark case, which was called Cherokee Nation versus Georgia in 1831 where Georgia basically came in and said, we're gonna divvy out um, Cherokee lands and we're gonna implement laws. And the Supreme Court said, no, you can't do that. Tribes are distinct uh, political societies separated from others. 
Um, tribes are not foreign, but they're what we call domestic dependent nations. And uh, they're like a guardian. Uh, there's a, the relation is that of a ward to a guardian. And so that's kind of how that relationship, I think it's important for people to really understand, you know, how did that transpire? Where did Congress and how was the government involved in tribal relations? And it's, there's a lot of examples in case law and, and a lot more to it, but that's just kind of the, the, the groundwork for, for those, um, for the starting of relationships with tribes. And then the last case out of the Marshall trilogies was uh, Wooster versus Georgia, which basically said um, state laws are excluded from Indian affairs. So uh, that's why basically there was a, some missionaries who went into Indian country. The state of uh, Georgia said, hey, you guys have to get a license to go into Indian country. Uh, the Supreme Court said, no, you don't. Uh, we we enforce those laws. We basically manage and we're in charge of Indian country. Uh, state laws don't apply here. So that kind of sets the groundwork for, for a lot of the um, things that people don't understand a lot of times where, you know, why the state's laws, you know, aren't enforced in Indian country. They don't understand how that relationship was developed with tribes. Uh, moving from there, you, we saw the movement to reservations from 1850 to 1887. Um, basically trying to keep distance from uh, uh, Westerners uh, and Indians. And so we saw that Indians were moved to reservations. The CSKT uh, reservation was formed by the Treaty of Hellgate in 1855. And um, later on, the little known fact that people don't generally know is that the Bitterroot Salish were actually in the Bitterroot Valley and were actually moved uh, by force. There's a famous picture, a lot of people I'm sure have seen that picture in Missoula at some point, where the Bitterroot Salish are moving across the Clark Fork back onto the, to the reservation. Part of the treaty was supposed to guarantee the Bitterroot Salish their own reservation. That never happened. They were actually forced to move over to the Flathead Reservation, which was not the original agreement of which Chief Charlo actually agreed upon. Um, so from there, we go to the allotments and assimilation era. And this is big to the Salish and Kootenai tribes because um, lands on the Flathead Reservation were, were heavily allotted, uh, and which is why like the CSKT Water Compact was so complicated. Uh, There's a lot of allotted lands on the reservation and um, trying to come in and determine what the tribe's water rights was was very complicated. And it took a lot of experts over a lot of long time to quantify what the treaties Aboriginal rights were and what the um, treaty rights were to that. So um, one, one thing that a lot of folks don't know is that uh, the, um, through the Allot Flathead, Flathead Allotment Act, around 60% of the CSKT lands were lost during that, during that period. Um, and there were actually two rounds of allotments on the Flathead Reservation. Um, during that period, the, in 1908, the Flathead Indian Irrigation Project was also built. Um, it was supposed to be for the, the tribes, for the Indians, to benefit the Indians, but it mostly benefited non-Indians, you know, irrigators. Um, after the Allotment Act, um, the, the uh, tribes also uh, lost lands in the, um, well, one that's in the paper uh, the last couple days was the National Bison Range. They carved out the National Bison Range out of tribal lands and um, set that aside for, um, for, the, for that range. That was originally uh, tribal lands and um, was actually deemed a taking at, um, by the courts. Uh, so we kind of moved from the, uh, from the allotment era and, and then we, we moved to the um, Indian Reorganization Act. And um, during that time, from 1934, the they passed an act called the Wheeler-Howard Act, which basically allowed tribes to reorganize and form constitutions. The Salish Kootenai tribes was the first tribe to um, reorganize under the IRA uh, to form a constitution. A lot of tribes opted not to form um, constitutions under the IRA for you know many reasons. Some believed it was you know went away from the um, traditional structure of the tribes, and so a lot of tribes you know, for whatever reason, opted not to form, formulate the, um, as an IRA um, reserve, or tribe. Um, the CSK did that in 1935, and that also ended the allotment era. Um, 
on, on reservations uh, across the country. And uh, um, I guess I left out one little important fact that's not little. During the allotment era, um, after lands were divvied out to individual members, they took the tribal lands and um, the surplus lands were divvied out to homesteaders. So basically, um, I can't, I, I think I remember reading something about, there was like 2,000, they did a census count, and each head of household got 160 acres, and then each single adult got 80 acres. And so the excess, the surplus, after all the tribal members were um, divvied out allotments, uh, those lands were then dished out in the homesteads. And so, and then uh, um, after 25 years, the Indians that had maintained their lands and, and as farmers, those lands went into fee and even more tribal lands were lost at that time because a lot of tribal members couldn't afford to pay the taxes um, on those properties. So they'd lose them to counties or lose them for little, uh, you know, to have to basically get rid of them for um, very, very little money. So. Uh, you kind of start to see the, the history of the policies, and so you know some people will say that some of the policymakers had really good intentions. You know, they wanted to make tribes uh, help tribal members, civilize tribal members, uh, you know, and and um, help them become agrarian farmers. And so, you know, that's when you see the Indian Reorganization Act. They recognize, okay, allotment period failed, um, so we have to do something else. You know, so they uh, developed the IRA and 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 the the structures of governments, and so. From there, you saw the termination and relocation era, which was intended to terminate tribes and just fully push tribes into, in, into society. Um, the CSKT were originally the first on that list, and um, the CSKT went um, heavily advocated to be taken off of the list, and we were successfully able to remove ourselves off of the list um, from being on the termination. A lot of tribes were, in fact, terminated. Um, and then they also offered programs for relocating folks. Um, and I actually, my uncle was actually part of the, the relocation period. He actually ended up taking a job in Seattle and ended up moving, now he lives in, in Arizona, but he was a part of that program. Um, so then, from there we go to the tri tribal self-determination era, which is 1968 to now. And um, that, the 19, in 1975, the Indian Self-Determination Act was passed, and tribes entered basically all the programs that were ran for tribes by government. Um, tribes had the option to, to take over those programs, those con under contracts, to assume um, our own programs, to take care of our own needs. And, um, and so there's a history to that, you know, and, and I'll talk about that a little bit more here in a second. But at that time, tribes were basically recognized that, you know, tribes were here forever. You know, we're not going to try and... Uh, terminate them or eliminate them and have them just blend into mainstream society. So I think it's very important for, for you guys to understand the history in the federal relationship, um, which brings me to the, to the status of where, where, where are Indians at today, you know? And um, it's important to know, you know, before I kind of dive into this, that, you know, not all tribes are the same. We're, we differ socially, economically. Um, and historically, a lot of us, you know, although some, some tribes may be similar culturally, um, we're not all the same, especially in Montana. A lot of us differ greatly in language and everything. Um, a lot of times people don't know that. You know, they, they just think everybody, just Indian, we're all kind of the same, you know. And so, um, and, and I kind of try to go in with that mindset a lot of times when I talk to people. I, I you know, I like to assume that people don't know really anything. And, and sometimes people know a lot, a lot of times they don't know it. I'm right, they don't know anything. So, uh, especially at the, at the legislature, uh, you, you, you learn, that's not a shout out our representatives here. Okay. Missoula does quite well um, uh, at understanding uh, Indian issues. So, um, so, you know, I think it's important to kind of look at where we're at today and the, kind of the ripple effects of, of those policies and to, to kind of understand, you know, a lot of times when I, I'm at the legislature, you know, it's, it's kind of this mindset like Indians, you know, you guys just want handouts, you guys just want, you know, you guys are you're alcoholics, you're, um, and so it's, when you look at the policies and you kind of see the relationship that's developed or that was put in place, and you see where tribes are generally, there's not very much economic opportunity, um, you know, there's, there's high poverty, tribes are at the bottom of every social and economic indicator out there, period. And so, you, when, when, you know, it's really upsetting to me and frustrating a lot of times when I see people, you know, um, 
you know, especially I read the comments in the Missoulian and, um, you know, you'll often see people, you know, oh, another handout, you know, and, and it's really hard to swallow that when you, you see that tribes, you know, we're, we're at the bottom of everything. And, and to say we're, <laughs> to say we're, at, we're getting handouts is, I mean, it's upsetting, you know, um, it's making me tear up a little bit right now. But, um, so what is the health status today? Well, a lot of you probably heard this, that the life expectancy of a white male is 19 years longer than, than an Indian male in Montana. It's 20 years longer for a white woman than an Indian woman. We know that Indians in Indian country through IHS are underinsured. 60% um, of the costs are covered through IHS. And so, yes, we, we were successful in Medicaid expansion last session, um, which was huge, but, you know, it's still, that didn't cover the need. You know, we, we have a lot of people that qualify for that, that meet the, that fall under the criteria for the poverty level, but we still, um, still are lacking greatly across the state in, the, in, in that category. Um, suicide rates, we know that 9.59% of American Indian students attempt suicide in Montana, which is double uh, of all the other students at 4.7. Um, we know that 26.4% of all suicides in Montana are American Indian. American Indians are 6% of the population. So when you think about that, I mean, 26% of all suicides in, in Montana are, are American Indians. Incarceration rate is 38% higher than the national average for Native Americans nationally. Um, and four times, Native Americans are incarcerated four times higher than white men. Um, the uh, MSP, Montana State Prison is 17% of the inmates are Indian, and again, the, the state population is around 6.6% um, for the for Indians across Montana. So, uh, resources, you know, housing needs. You know, we see that um, HUD housing. A lot of tribes have HUD housing programs, um, and there's still housing needs for a lot of tribal members. We know that um, economic well-being. 32 to 36% of Montana Indians live below poverty. We know that uh, less than 50% of Indians are working and you know that's kind of goes to the point earlier it's like a lot of people say well you guys why don't Indians just get jobs you know it's there aren't any jobs available you know and and the jobs that are available it's they're not living wages so it's it's hard to survive so I've had people say it's easier to live on services I mean because I won't get eliminated for service from services if I'm making you know a certain amount of money and I can't survive on that, so I actually get more from the services that I qualify for, and and so that's why you know living wages are so important, you know, in Montana and on reservations especially. Um, we know that economic development tribes are doing a lot of different things nowadays. Our tribe, we have lots of different corporations now. You know, we we took over um, uh, SKQ Dam now, and and you know we're making a lot of efforts to try and grow economic development on our reservation. I know a lot of the other tribes are doing the same. Um, uh, one statistic that just that kind of hits home to me is the education dropout rates. Twenty nine percent of dropouts are Indian um, and Indian students at uh, in Montana, and ten percent ten percent of the state public school population is is Indian, and twenty nine percent of the dropouts are Native American students. And you know one of the things that a lot of our legislators in this room have helped work on last session was language preservation, and we know that a lot of languages are on the verge of extinction in Montana. You know, um, you know, some tribes have, you can, they can count how many uh, fluent speakers on their hand, in one hand, you know, I mean, less than five, or less than two, you know, in some, some places. So, um, so we, we, it's very disheartening, you know, to, when you look at it, look at the history and look at where we are now. And, and I always, you know, I often see this a lot of times and, and I see a lot of times there's a double standard, I feel like in Indian country, you know, on one hand, you know, we, we get a lot of pressure in, in to tribes saying, hey, why aren't you guys contributing? You know, you guys get handouts, handouts, handouts. Um, but on the other hand, we, we're still trying to address the ripple effects from the policies, you know, that have kind of shaped a lot of the issues that we deal with from day to day in Indian country. So, you know, that all said, you know, I always find it very interesting or important to point out, you know, how much money tribes actually do contribute to the local society. and in Montana and you know a report in 2003 that was came out by Eleanor Yellowrobe estimated over a billion dollars you know that was in 2003 the CSKT 
um, contributes you know, millions of dollars to roads and bridges, we, fire suppression, um, we have hundreds of non-member um, employees that pay both state and federal taxes. Um, and so that brings me to the last piece. Uh, I, I was going to, I, I know that this is, I, I'm already running out of time. And so, um, you know, I was gonna read a snippet from the Missoulian today, uh, or from yesterday, you know, comments that were under the National Bison Range um, the, the proposal by Fish Wildlife Services to the tribes that just, just came out. Um, you know, and a lot of it was talking about, you know, and the tribes were given the dam, now they, they're given this, you know, and, and I'm just sitting there like, we saved up millions and millions of dollars over many, many years to purchase that, you know, and, and we worked that into our contract to, to make that transaction happen, you know. Um, but, and that came out of our general funds, you know, out of leasing monies and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, Going to stereotypes at the legislature, um, you know, I have a long list of things that we contribute to in, in, in Montana, um, in, in the CSKT specifically. But, you know, without having an Indian representation or minority representation in the legislature, you know, we're never going to, we need to educate people to understand those issues, you know, not to just show up and say, you know, I mean, I've, my experiences at the legislature have basically been, you know, you, oh, you see us, KT, you guys have a casino, you know, so you guys must be a rich tribe. You know, it's like, well, we have high unemployment rates just like every other tribe. Um, and we're lucky to, to even make money off of that at, at some years, you know. So what it does do, though, is it creates jobs and, you know, allows people and puts people to work. And the CSKT, one thing that I'm really proud of with our tribe is that we actually pay, you know, the lowest wage that we pay starts around 10, a little over $10, you know, which... In Montana, you know, it's 805. So, you know, we, we already set the standard. We do have some jobs that are a little bit um, less than that, but that's pretty much where almost all of our jobs enter at is a little over $10. So, you know, you hear things like tribes don't pay taxes. You know, every single tribal member pays federal taxes. Um, people believe that per caps are funded by everyone else's tax money. Uh, that's, not, that's not true. That comes from the general funds. The tribes pay those taxes or the tribes pay into a general fund through our resources, through, through leases, our businesses, and then that money gets divided out to the membership. And, and our reservation is $1,200 a year, which you know, is not enough to, to live off of by any means. You know? So, um, you know, and some of the other ones that I'm sure Dustin will talk about you know, is everyone's alcoholics, everyone's addicts, you know, a lot of people are criminals, you know, and people don't understand the underlying issues from you know, those ripple effects of all that stuff. So, um, you know, people in Montana forget that tribal members are state citizens too, and that's one thing, you know, I think the delegation here in Missoula have been really good at doing is um, educating people and making sure that tribal members are, um, are recognized and, and brought into all the discussions on issues. So uh, with that, you know, I, I have like another page and a half of stuff, but I'm well <laughs> over now, so, and Dustin's giving me the, the side eye, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I'm a Blackfeet, a Cine and then I'm also a Cinnaboyne. I identify with uh, both tribes. I'm enrolled as Cinnaboyne, and I am a descendant of the Blackfeet tribe. I always make sure it's important that I say both tribes. Um, <clears throat> and then some of the things that I do here, I, um, I'm the founder and CEO of an organization called Native Generational Change. That's working with intergenerational mobility for uh, Native Americans. And one of the things I really like to point out, like my group, people, what they try to do is that when I tell them what I do, they think like I have to work on a reservation. I said, no, I live here in Missoula. You know, my office is right down here. And so that's always a good thing to talk. I guess when I'm coming here, I really like to, when we talk about Native issues, I feel so many times like we actually put Natives in the fence. You know, like we try to think like that reservation, that's only Indian country. All of Montana is Indian country. You know, and there's actually more natives in the last census going to be living in the urban environments than on the reservation. And the largest voting block for Native Americans is 18 to 35. And so it's a whole generation of new uh, voters that are actually coming up, having issues. If you look at us, we're all, you know, we're all pretty young coming up here. I mean, I'm very proud of this guy running this year. It takes a lot of courage. But I mean, there's a whole different generation of Native Americans than from the past where your whole goal of actually even becoming a leader was tribal council. 
And so you never really thought of just actually going out and moving to the environment. It was always coming back to the reservation, but now we are really making um, strides outside of the reservation in Montana. And we've had a lot of seats, even in Billings, we've had a lot of uh, legislators run all throughout the state. And we have pushes for that. And we have organizations just set up to do the get out to vote. Uh, my organization, we, we actually uh, focus more on um, turning out the voters rather than um, really registering. Because if you look at the data for the last election cycles and possibly two election cycles, the Native Americans, we have registered record numbers. But the problem is the getting them to vote. And the block that doesn't vote is the 18 to 35. And that's not just Native Americans, that's all across the board. And so it's really focusing on that and getting the message um, out to them about voting. Uh, Shane covered a lot of the issues here and gave you a lot of the statistics, the background that was really good. And that's really good to you know, know. Um, some of the bills, like for myself, I actually brought a bill uh, last session called House Bill 509. And that was a mental health bill. And I actually worked with, um, I went to high school in Great Falls, and so I got to work with Casey Schreiner. Me and Casey grew up together, and he actually sponsored the bill. But that was a very unique thing because people were like, you need to go to a Native American legislator. You know, they almost kind of put me in a box. And I said, you know what, 